On this episode, I wanted to discuss how to be a rare book dealer, especially for those interested in getting into the trade who are perhaps intimidated by that first step. Now, to be a rare book dealer, you do not need a PhD in history or literature, and you do not need to speak 20 languages, uh, although speaking at least one, especially English, is a valuable communication tool. The fundamental qualification for being a rare book dealer is actually to purchase a rare book and to sell a rare book. Now you might be saying, well, he's being facetious, that's too simple. Uh, but that actually is uh, the basic truth of how you enter the trade. So I thought in this video I would give an illustrative example of the book I have in my hand here uh, and tell you where I bought it, how much I paid, why I was interested in it, what I learned about it, and how I want to go about selling it. And hopefully that will be a valuable example if you are sincerely interested in getting started in book selling. The book I have is actually written by Saint Basil of Caesarea, a fourth century author, although this is a Renaissance translation printed in 1512. So it is what we call in the lingo of the rare book world a post-incunable edition, a book printed after the infancy of printing, but technically before about 1530. Um, now, before I get to discussing the text itself, let's talk about, as I promised, where I purchased it from. I'll have to pull up my records here. I bought this book in 2019, so it's been sitting on the shelves here, uh, aging like a wheel of Parmesan cheese, and I bought it at the venerable auction house of Doyle's in New York, so a shout out, shout out to that book department there. It was estimated at $500 to $800, and I ended up paying $1,500, so above the estimate, but it's very hard to purchase uh, decent books within the estimate these days. Auction houses often set them artificially low to entice bidders, and I'm often more worried if I get it within the estimate than if I pay more. The book uh, was printed by Jacob Thanner in 1512, and what caught my eye and attention uh, was the accurate, if, uh, concise description Doyle provided, where they wrote a scarce post-incunable edition printed in Leipzig by a printer who apparently later printed an edition of the 95 Theses of Martin Luther. So if someone says the 95 Theses of Luther, my ears pick up, my bidding hand raises, and that is because uh, that is a moment, of course, in the popular imagination of Luther hammering uh, that broadside to the church door in uh, Wittenberg, uh, a university discussion of the validity of church uh, indulgences. But it was the moment that ushered in the uh, Protestant uh, Reformation. But even more than that, it was a seminal moment in the history of printing, which always interested in me, because if you consider that Gutenberg really ushered in the age of printing and the dissemination of knowledge, at least in Western Europe, with the invention of the press, perhaps after that there is no more pivotal moment, no, more, no greater example than the uh, consequence of that dissemination of information, how quickly it could transform society and influence politics than that 1517 broadside of Martin Luther. Now, my hopes will always be dashed of ever owning an actual uh, uh, 95 Theses broadside. There are only, I think, six surviving copies, and if a seventh ever surfaced, uh, it would be uh, extraordinarily expensive and unobtainable. But here was an opportunity to own a book printed by Jacob Thanner, who only seven years later then went on to print uh, the 95 uh, Theses. So that was really interesting to me. Now, Jacob Thanner was not the only print of the 95 Theses. There was another simultaneous German printing of it, I think, by um, Hieronymus Holtzius in Nuremberg. Uh, but these are the unsung heroes of uh, the Protestant Reformation because, of course, the 95 Theses did not magically uh, go from that church door to being in the popular imagination. These were the men who printed it and disseminated uh, those uh, broadsides. Uh, now, this is, of course, discussed in a very famous work uh, by uh, Elizabeth uh, Eisenstein years ago, I read, uh, that interested me in the book trade, actually. 
printing as an agent of change. So that always stuck in my mind, the 95 theses as one of the pivotal moments that printing was seen as an agent of change. So I was ready to bid on the book. So what's the first thing I do is actually I investigate the rarity of the book. I don't want to start bidding on books that pop up every six months at auction. And when I put the title into a rare book hub to check the auction records, this was the only copy actually that came up. And it actually came from an estate, uh, Doyle's wrote, The Estate of an Upper East Side Collector, so fresh to market. So at least the title itself was rare in commerce. Uh, now, what about generally Jacob Thanner imprints, because that is what interested me. Well, if I just put in that as a printer for other titles, uh, he is also quite rare in the uh, Rare Book Hub database, at least in the trade or in commerce. Although Thanner imprints are well represented institutionally, and you can check various databases online like VD16, which is the uh, German 16th century database of imprints, or I use First Search, or uh, more broadly available, if you're not a book dealer, is worldcat.org. So his imprints are not rare institutionally, but as I said, they are rare in commerce. Now, beyond that uh, cursory investigation, I could not pour hours of endless research into a book that I'm only going to bid on, but I do not own yet. Uh, you will find that to be an extraordinary waste of time, especially uh, when you start losing uh, lots to more formidable, if not astute, bidders, which happens a lot to me. So I checked later uh, after the auction, and uh, sure enough, I won this book, probably among some others uh, sitting on the shelves here in storage. Uh, and uh, once I had it in hand, I had to start investigating it and researching it and then figuring out uh, where I wanted to try and sell it. Now, I immediately went back, as soon as I had it, to investigating Jacob Thanner as a printer. One of the first things I did was I asked myself, well, what if I hold this book up against a copy of the 95 Theses and I wanted to see some similarities uh, in their printing uh, as both an academic and a selling point. And it's very easy to download an original copy uh, uh, online of the 95 Theses. And lo and behold, uh, the type matches pretty much perfectly with the 95 Theses. So we obviously reuse the type in the printing house to print that famous document, which made it uh, very interesting, if not exciting for me. Another thing I noticed was uh, the printer's emblem at the back, which I never actually seen before. And it actually incorporates a globe, uh, one of the earliest uh, printer's emblems to incorporate a map, which I found sort of fascinating. It's actually the cross over the globe showing uh, that Christianity has triumphed over the universe. Now, there are lots of people who say, well, it doesn't look like a globe. Uh, sure enough, in the uh, 15th and 16th centuries, there were many fine world maps, Portland charts and 16th century printed maps. Uh, but this is a very abstract uh, depiction of the globe, and it actually harkens back to uh, what they call the famous T map, which appeared in Isidore of Seville's uh, well-known encyclopedia, which was a very simplistic depiction of the world, but the world in a map, nevertheless, uh, often in a geometric T form, with the T being the Mediterranean and Jerusalem at the center. So that was a very curious uh, printer's emblem that I've actually never seen before. It was enjoyable to study. And, of course, it's a selling point as well for people who like maps and globes. Um, then I started to consider the text itself, not just uh, the printer. And as I said, this was pr uh, written by St. Basil of uh, Caesarea in the 4th century, but it was actually translated in uh, the Renaissance by Leonardo Bruni, one of the most famous humanists uh, ever. Uh, and it is a work uh, here in a uh, different title of called De Portarum, but it was a work to introduce books of the ancients uh, into modern readers. So it's actually one of the earliest books on books. And it was very interesting because they talk about, uh, I guess what you would consider pagan literature in the day, not just biblical studies, everything from Plato to poets. So it was an incredibly uh, influential text uh, in humanist circles and in education in the 16th century. Uh, which is most unfortunate for me, because as interesting as that text was, it was so popular that it was frequently printed. And I think there's 450 surviving manuscript copies of this text, as well as about 90-something 
odd editions of it printed through the 16th century. So in terms of the text itself, as fascinating as that is for the history of education and being an early book on book, a very specialized area of book collecting, it is not a particularly rare text. So I don't think I'd sell it on those merits alone, especially to uh, an institution. Uh, so, but what about this particular copy? Well, this copy is very well annotated in an early or contemporary hand, and annotations are of great interest uh, to collectors and librarians these days because they really show you how an early modern reader engaged with the text, especially when it's so extensively annotated like this copy, and particularly even the text is underscored, and there's lots of notes about the individual books that he's discussing, uh, Plato and various poets etc. What makes this copy even more extraordinary, and I really didn't know this until after the auction, was the last leaf here contains a, a German poem by the humanist Heinrich Bebel, uh, and it's actually on uh, teaching uh, young people to understand the vanities of life. Now, I do not know if this is in the hand of that prominent humanist, or if it was just copied from one of his printed works, uh, but it's a nice manuscript addition to the work, and it makes this text uh, unique and even more interesting and exciting to researchers. What's also particularly fascinating is the annotator of this work, um, and as I said, it's in an early hand, uh, he not only annotated the book itself, he actually annotated the, the manuscript uh, addition to the work with some notes, uh, just as he had done throughout uh, the volume. So that is quite uh, curious to me. And in all these annotations hold a lot of potential for additional research and discoveries. Now, as a bookseller, I cannot do a dissertation level of research into every book that I have. I can always, only sometimes point out to curators and collectors uh, interesting things about the annotations. Uh, but after that, uh, they are welcome to research it more and perhaps they can discover who the annotator uh, was and may prove to be uh, important. It's always fun actually to leave some discovery on the table uh, for the next person I find. Another thing I like to consider when I'm selling it as part of the story of it is of course the provenance of the work. Is there anything special about who owned the book? The only thing in this book however is a 20th century owner but a very prominent one named Leo Young who is actually a rabbi uh, very important in uh, the in Orthodox uh, Judaism uh, in America. Uh, while that provenance is certainly interesting, it's not really a selling point for me in terms of a uh, German humanist text of education with uh, contemporary annotations. Maybe if it had 16th century or 17th century provenance, I could tie that uh, more into the story of the book. Now, where would I uh, consider selling the book? Well, one of the first things places I thought of is uh, the Morgan Library. A number of years ago, I had uh, been to, uh, I think it was John McLuhan's fine exhibit there on Luther. Uh, and they actually, if I remember, had a copy of uh, the 95 Theses, I think it was on loan from the Austrian State Library. So I said, well, the Morgan Library, having had that exhibition, is certainly a place that would appreciate uh, an early, important, annotated German uh, book like this, especially if I contact uh, the curator. Now, the first thing I do is, so I don't waste anybody's time, is actually check the Morgan Library's database online to see if they have a copy. Uh, they do not have a copy of the book. And I also have to check if they have other examples of the printer's work. And they do have another example of uh, Thanner's uh, imprints at the Morgan Library, but it is a different work and they don't have 10 copies of his imprints. So I can make a convincing case that they should perhaps own this uh, book for study. It would even enhance perhaps uh, the other imprint that they already have in their collection. Now, one of the great things is now, of course, I know the curator at the Morgan Library. I've, the curators, I should say, I've met them at various fairs and I know them through dealings over the years. So they may be receptive to receiving an email from me. But what if you're not an established bookseller already? Well, you will find that when you write a curators, and you can easily find a lot of their emails online, they're often extremely receptive to quotes and offers uh, and respond very favorably uh, with information. 
So I will be targeting uh, the Morgan Library with this book. Now, if they don't take it, I will offer it to other institutions and libraries, probably on the basis that it is annotated or other interesting aspects that I've talked about uh, already in uh, this video. So, uh, oh, there's still, of course, the question of what will I price it at? That is a fundamental question. I will probably price this book at three times what I paid for it, $4,500. Now, to some people, that may sound extraordinary. What a big markup, especially since so many prices are transparent online these days. All the databases are available. When you write curators and collectors, they can often see what you paid if you purchased it at auction. But how do you justify a $4,500 price? Well, as I say, there were a lot of interesting things about this book that I did not know until I actually won the book and had it in hand. And when I point that out, I think that collectors and curators, especially the astute ones, understand that. They also understand the concept of unsold inventory. For every book you sell, there are often quite a number that you pour capital into that just sit on the shelves and keep your you know, profit margins uh, down. So I will certainly attempt to sell this one at a reasonable profit because I find it an extraordinarily interesting copy. So that is an example of how you go about being a rare bookseller, and I wish luck to anybody who wants to try. I'm happy to help and connect you with people if you want to contact me. So thank you so much for watching, and uh, please subscribe uh, to future episodes.